What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Natalia, also known as Chef Redakova, and this is the channel that you need to subscribe to if you haven't done it already. If you are passionate and interested about culinary world, if you want to elevate your cooking skills from the basic home cook to the chef level, and if you are just interested in fine dining and plating techniques. Okay, now that it's done, let's get to the video. This video is another ingredient breakdown video, the purpose of which is to really understand the ingredients, to know what it is, what it does, and how, if you want to use it in cooking. So in this video, we're going to be focusing on Yota Karginan, a member of the Karginan family along with Kappa and Lambda Kargenans. I've actually made already a video about Kappa Karginan, which is very interesting and informative, so do check it out over here. So. Yota, as well as all the other members of the Karaginan family, is a hydrocolloid, which means that it forms some sort of a gel when in contact with water. And good examples of um, either hydrocolloids would be gelatin, agar-agar, and xanthum gum. The difference, however, between uh, kappa Karaginan and Yota Karaginan is that Yota forms more of an elastic and soft type of gel in comparison to kappa that forms more of a rigid and firm type of gel. An interesting and hopefully useful thing about Yota Karaginan is that it is plant-based. It comes from some sort of a red seaweed, so it has a huge application in vegan and plant-based recipes. In order for Yota Karaginan to form a gel, it not only needs to be dissolved in water, but also brought up to a certain temperature, around 185 degrees Fahrenheit. And I would say that in order for it to work properly, it also needs to get in contact with calcium. And that's the difference between kappa and Yota Karaginans. Kappa needs to get in contact with potassium and Yota with calcium. And if you are now confused and it's just too much, too many technical things, don't worry about that. I've created a fact sheet that you can check out and download in the community members area on my channel and also on Patreon. Just like when working with other hydrocolloids, you only need a very, very tiny amount of Yota Karaginan in order to work for your recipes. And I'm talking about starting from 0.01%. Of course, sometimes it can be more, but this amount is already enough to give some kind of impact to your recipe. And it best works when teamed up with starch. Okay, two more things about this ingredient before we move on to its practical application. So first thing is that when you use Yota Karaginan for gelling, it will give you a very clear appearance which means that it will not cloud your liquid at all, which, for example, Kappa Karaginan would a little bit. And the other thing is that Yota Karaginan gels, they are suitable for freezing temperatures, which again, Kappa are not. If you put your Kappa Karaginan gel in the um, freezer, it will start to leak out the liquids in a while. Okay, now let's talk about the important stuff, what we are all here for. So if you're still watching this video, here is the invisible Oscar for you guys. <laughs> And now let's talk about how we can use our Yota Karaginan in recipes. You will find many recipes that call for a combination of Kappa and Yota Karaginans, but it doesn't mean that you can't use Yota on its own. However, <laughs> we've already done several videos uh, using this combination. For example, you can use a combination of Kappa and Yota Karaginans as a coagulant to make silken tofu. You can also use this combination to make uh, vegan and eggless custards, panna cottas and puddings. And there will be another video coming out shortly, it's called uh, peanut butter custard. So here is one application of Yota Karaginan on its own, which of course is not the only application, because the world is your oyster, guys, when it comes to your culinary imagination. <laughs> Because it's quite flavorless, you can use Yota Karaginan as some sort of a thickener to substitute the roux, which is quite starchy in taste. So, for example, you can use it in your favorite mac and cheese to substitute the roux completely and emphasize these cheesy notes in your mac and cheese, especially if you're using some kind of 
fancy cheese types. Now I hope that you have some understanding about this ingredient and you can decide for yourself if and how you want to use it in your cooking. Talking about that, do share your culinary creations with me. I always love to check them out. But for today, guys, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to like it and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done already. And I'll see you in the next video.